Hello. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Boongarong, the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nations and all traditional owners of the land that is Australia. We recognise the traditional owners' continuing connection to land, waterways and community. We pay respect to elders past and present and we acknowledge their stories, traditions and living cultures. As Jewish women, we specifically honour and acknowledge First Nations women who, like our matriarchs, are strong, brave, determined and resilient. Good afternoon. My name is Helen Lewin and it is my privilege and pleasure as the President of National Council of Jewish Women of Australia, the Victorian section, to welcome you here today for our celebration of International Women's Day 2023. We are and always have been an organisation led by women, focused on women, looking to find ways to help women and girls live better, believe in themselves and achieve more than they thought was possible, bettering their lives. This is a reason to celebrate and we are celebrating this occasion in conjunction with the Council of Christian and Jews who also want to celebrate women today. So accordingly, I would like to welcome our president, Lady Marigold Southey AC, the, ve the venerable Dr. Colleen O'Reilly, Archdeacon of Stonington, Dr. David Singer, Councillor of the City of Glen Ira, past presidents and life governors of National Council of Jewish Women, and all other VIPs and guests. I'd like to expressly thank Nelly Karashia, who is our dedicated and long-standing member and who lives and breathes Connect, our seniors' programs. She's responsible for planning and arranging this event today. Thank you, Nelly. Your dedication is heartwarming and inspiring. Jewish women have been in Australia from the beginning of European settlement. Our organisation was established by Dr Fanny Redding, MBE, who grew up in Melbourne and held the first meeting for this organisation in her parents' home on the 28th of November, 1927. This was a time when women were virtually unrepresented in any Australian parliament. Dr. Reading gave women a voice and provided an outstanding model for community leadership. And 95 years later, National Council continues this legacy. We stand on the shoulders of the generations of women who came before us and who have been the flag bearers for Jewish women from, from the time this organisation began. Since that time, we have worked to support, promote, empower and advance women and girls. Our programs and activities, events and campaigns are focused on resolving the unmet needs of women and girls. Our Caring Mums program provides emotional support to new mothers in their first year of their baby's life. Our volunteers, who are women usually in their midlife, are trained to provide that emotional support. The program is now, on, is, is now in its 11th year and going strong. Our JAM project is designed for girls in year nine. It aims to empower them in their transition to adulthood and to put it into the words of one of their mentors. The JAM project serves as an incubator for female empowerment. It serves as a beautiful place where women band together in strength. When we engage in complex discussions about things that matter, that's when strong, empowered, brave females are created. This is the future, and these females together will truly create unbelievable change. Our seniors' programs provide a range of activities for various groups of senior women and some men, providing them with a safe, secure and happy place with a variety of events and activities that they can come to and enjoy. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, our focus today is on gender equality. We have been promoting gender equity since the inception of our campaign, the Makerspace for Her campaign, which began in 2019. We've worked with a variety of Jewish community organisations to roll out our gender equality pledge calling on those organisations to implement gender equality in their organisations so that they can provide uh, opportunities for work for women, as the same opportunities for work for women as they do for men. 
We have over 55 organisations who have signed the pledge. And as a result of this work, we've now developed an online directory of Jewish women that will feature talented women from our community who can provide skills and expertise in a diverse range of topics and cap capacities that are now positioned to fill those opportunities in those Jewish community organisations that have been created. Thank you very much for joining us today. I hope you'll all enjoy International Women's Day celebration, and I could go on, but now it's time for me to introduce Alex Katz, who is the Chairman of the Council for Christians and Jews, and who, is a, who has a demonstrated history of volunteering in a range of community organisations. He's passionate about community education and also women. Thank you very much, uh, Helen. It's a great honour and pleasure for me to be here. Um, and as Helen said, um, I'm the chair of the Council of Christians and Jews. Um, we're partnering here because, um, partly because our, um, of the guest speaker who I'm going to introduce shortly, but partly also because personally and as an organisation, we're very much um, into uh, um, recognising and honouring women. Um, although I'm male and all, and all but one of our chairmen have been male, um, uh, half our board is female and we're very um, intent on ensuring that that continues. As an organisation, we promote um, Christians and Jews coming together for all sorts of purposes, including purposes like this. Um, uh, our, our motto is walking together towards mutual understanding, and we also often partner with other organisations to ensure that our message gets through in, in many different ways. Um, if you want, um, you can see Liz at the, at the end, and she can give you a that's Liz over there, um, and she can give you our latest publication and also cop um, our membership forms so you can join us and find out what we do as well and join our mailing list. Um, but for me in particular, as I said, um, I'm very, I've always been an ally in this space. I consider myself a male feminist. I've always said that about myself even when I was, even when I was a kid, so I'm very happy to, to be here. Um, and in a sense, um, one of the reasons, and I don't want to get too political, but one of the reasons um, why I'm very much a supporter um, of, of um, the, the gender equity pledge that the NCJW um, uh, uh, talks about is, to me, the, the concept is very similar to the current um, debate that, we, that the country's having about the voice. The, uh, maybe ideally, um, Indigenous people would be the same as us, but because they're not, their, their views need to be considered whenever decisions are made about them. In the same sense, um, if ideally, men and women should possibly be equal, I don't know. But, but there's definitely a gender pay gap in this country. There's definitely other issues. The women are very much below men in many situations. And I think that needs to change, which is why I'm very much happy to, to be here today. As part of that, one person who I know is a pioneer in this space is Colleen O'Reilly, or more accurately, the venerable Dr. Colleen O'Reilly AM. Um, I first met Colleen when she was Vicar of St. George's in Malvern. Before that, she was Vicar of St. Uh, Faith's in Burwood. Um, in the 1970s, she was a pioneer of women's ordination in the Anglican Church. Um, in the 80s, with a PhD in theology, she trained men to be priests, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, and then she herself became ordained in 1995 and recently retired as chaplain of Trinity College. She's currently the Archdeacon of Stonington. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Colleen as our guest speaker this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for that welcome and um, good afternoon to you all. Well, thank you for the invitation to celebrate International Women's Day with you. I've been asked to speak about the pathway uh, of women in the Anglican Church to ordination. It's a pathway that some friends and I began to walk in 1974 in Sydney. We knew it would be a profound shift, and it is, and yet in many ways it's become the new normal. But there's an earlier story to ours in 1974, so let me begin with the story in 1944. In 1944, the, during the World War, the Anglican bishop in Hong Kong and China found himself unable to send a priest into neutral Macau to care for the people there who included many refugees from the war. 
There was, however, a woman deacon looking after the people, a woman called Florence Lee Tim Oi. She was the only Christian minister there, but she wasn't a priest, so she wasn't able to function as fully as possible in her role. Bishop Hall decided, contrary to tradition and practice, to ordain her as a priest. And Florence crossed enemy territory to get to the bishop because the bishop had to lay hands on her to, to ordain her. And of course, after the war, when this became more widely known, there were all sorts of objections to what the bishop had done, Bishop Paul. But he said he was determined that no prejudices should prevent the congregations in his care having the sacraments of the church for which he needed a priest. Well, at the end of the war, and in the light of all the furor about it, Florence agreed not to practice as a priest, but she never gave up her orders, as we call them. She never stopped being ordained. She suffered persecution under the communists in China, but in 1983, she was able to leave and go to live in Canada, where she lived out her days. Then in 1971, that same diocese, Hong Kong, ordained two women. And it became the beginning of the start of a new awareness throughout the Anglican world that the ordination of women was indeed an issue. In 1974, 11 women deacons were ordained by retired bishops in Philadelphia and the issue became even more lively across the churches in the, of the, that were in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury, the churches of England around the world. In 1973, I'd come back from living in the United States and second wave feminism was a very lively issue, so when I heard about the Philadelphia 11, I thought, what a great idea, we'll tell the bishops here and they can do it too. Well, how naive were we? <laughs> but we formed a lobby group called Anglican Women Concerned. We were tiny, but we made out we were much bigger than we were. We discovered later that there was also a group in Adelaide called Women in Holy Orders who were also working for the same end. But let me tell you, our task became an education in church politics. We had much fun as well. It was energising to think of strategies to get our message across to the wider church. So let me share with you one of those stories from the early days. Every four years, the National Church comes together in a decision-making body that's called the General Synod. It always begins with a church service and all the bishops process into the cathedral in all their importance. On this occasion, in 1977, the Archbishop of Canterbury was visiting, so that was quite a deal. We decided to stage some street theatre at the door of the cathedral so it wouldn't go unnoticed. And all the bishops would have to walk past. We had one woman arranging flowers. We had another pouring tea. We had a third embroidering church linen. All roles that women were allowed to take part in the church. And we also had a woman priest, but her hands were tied. The second time, four years later, we arranged some street theatre and we had within our group a woman engineer, a woman lawyer, a woman doctor, and the same woman priest with her hands tied. But the first time that we did it, one of our group was the daughter of a bishop in Sydney, and he would not be able to miss seeing her as he walked past into the cathedral, and nor would his colleagues. He did get a great surprise. Another member of the group was then uh, was a member of the family that en then owned the Sydney Morning Herald. So she said, oh, tell my brother what we're doing. Well, the following Monday morning, we were on the front page of the Herald 
with the tableau at one side of the cathedral, a crowd of supporters on the other, the Archbishop of Canterbury looking across most interested and most amused, and the Archbishop of Sydney looking ahead with a face like thunder. <laughs> Well, from then on, the debate really was fully underway. There was fierce opposition and there was equally determined support. We mounted a street theatre of all sorts, we printed leaflets, we wrote articles and we took on all sorts of leadership roles in parishes and nationally to demonstrate what women could accomplish. It was an education. We had to learn how to function in the synods and, and how to lobby and how to argue and how to get our case across. Well, by 1973, there was sufficient momentum to establish the movement for the ordination of women. We were establishing an Australian branch of an organisation that was then very active in the United Kingdom. And the issue had become lively right across the English speaking world. So as I said, we got ourselves elected to synods, we learned parliamentary procedures, we learned how to move motions and even bills. I moved a bill, which is like an act of synod. In the Sydney Parliament, I had every step absolutely spelled out before me so I didn't make a mistake in front of all the blokes. And I did get that bill through. In 1986, women were able to become deacons first step to becoming a priest. However, it wasn't until 1992 when the Archbishop of Perth, Peter Carnley, finally ordained women priests in a preemptive move to clear the way that things really changed. He had just become fed up with waiting for the National Church to make a decision. On one occasion, the vote was lost by one person, one vote. But having broken the, uh, the nexus, that finally the General Synod voted in favour and then other dioceses followed. Of course, there were so many women waiting, so many women deacons in Melbourne waiting to be ordained priests that they had three ordinations in a row, three nights it took to ordain them all. I wasn't living in Melbourne at that stage. I was living in New South Wales and I went on the, on the uh, Saturday we went to ordinations in Bathurst. Sunday afternoon we drove down to Goulburn, to the Ca um, Canberra Goulburn Cathedral to uh, be part of the ordinations there and on the Monday night we went to Newcastle. It was a time of great rejoicing and, uh, and, and great celebration. So there are now women bishops and one woman is an archbishop in Perth. That came about, the decision to have women bishops came about by decision of the appellate tribunal, the church's high court. When a friend and I took the case to them, we knew that a certain number of people could ask the question, can women be bishops? What we didn't realise is we organised the question to be asked, but then we discovered we had to mount a case that was like going to court, we had to get counsel. So we had to find a barrister and a solicitor who would uh, do the work for us pro bono and we paid their expenses. We had to fundraise to do that, but it was worthwhile. And now in Melbourne we have three women bishops and as an archdeacon I work closely with one of them. According to the Australian, um, the Anglican Church Directory, the Australian Directory, we now have a total, these are figures from 2021, we now have a total of 3,831 clergy of whom 888, 23% are women. So it's, it's probably about 24, 25% by now. So numbers are slowly creeping up. I was ordained, as Alex said, in 1995 when I came to Melbourne. I'd come in 94 to become the Associate Dean of the Melbourne College of Divinity. I couldn't be ordained in Sydney, although I'd moved the Women Deacons Bill. I hadn't studied in the college that um, is the only approved place of study, and also my marriage to Walter, the wonderful Walter, was my second marriage, and that's a, a problem for Sydney. Um, I moved into parish ministry in 1999 after a few years of working in the Melbourne College of Divinity. That's now the University of Divinity. 
and I was a vicarious, um, Alex said, in two parishes in Burwood and Morven until I had to retire compulsorily at 70. And since then I've been doing some part-time work, which is as much as I want at this stage. Religions are essentially conservative since they keep alive knowledge and spirituality and practices that have been handed down over generations, often thousands of generations. But this ancient wisdom only remains relevant as it interacts with the culture and the context of each new generation. We have to find its wisdom, its gifts for us in each generation. Sometimes there are paradigm shifts which create dilemmas and tensions that divide religious communities. Our church was very divided over the ordination of women and at some stages it looked like we would never get the votes that were necessary. And at the moment we're divided over human sexuality. Can't agree on various aspects of, of, of that. The equality of women and our full participation in society and in church is one example of an interruption to the tradition. Some would say a contradiction to earlier beliefs. And I'm aware, of course, that these matters are debated in Jewish communities as well and that you, some communities have women rabbis and others don't. There are still obstacles in the way of full equality there's an unconscious bias in favour of men and patriarchal attitudes prevail. Nevertheless, women are now in leadership in the Anglican Church and I see slow but real growth in acceptance of this as the new normal. However, I would be negligent if I didn't acknowledge the reality that there remain too many countries, too many communities, Sadly, too many homes where women are not equally valued and are even oppressed. I'm sure I don't need to spell out for Jewish women what discrimination can feel like, in this case based on gender, and what lasting effects it can have on women's sense of well-being. We have only to recall the truly shocking statistic that in Australia, on average, three women are killed by a husband or partner each day. Is that not a stunning figure? And it says to us that we don't have to do anything wrong as women to be vulnerable. We are simply vulnerable because of who we are, women. Well, I had a look at the website for the National Council of Jewish Women and I am very impressed by all that you're doing to promote the development of women in all aspects of life, in your mentoring of young girls, encouraging people to be bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, supporting mothering, that's certainly work that's undervalued, isn't it? Asking organisations to pledge to equality and ensuring the participation of women in leadership. Um, I was very grateful to see the work that you're doing. So today I'm very pleased to celebrate with you the achievements of women who are now free in Australian society to pursue whatever career their gifts and skills enable. May respect, equality and freedom flourish as women and men partner in the work of healing a world too ready to settle for division and inequality. I believe ours is a biblical vision, one we share as Jewish and Christian people who look to the Holy One who made us women and men in the image and likeness of our Creator in order that we might flourish as we embrace the dignity of being in the Creator's female likeness. So thank you for your... Well, I really wanted to thank you for that really incredible keynote. As a younger generation of women, we are so grateful for women like yourself and lots of women in the room today who have been the shoulders for me to stand on. Without trailblazers like yourself, I wouldn't be able to be making the impact that I'm making as a young Jewish woman, as a CEO, while I have a young family 
and juggling the whole work-life balance. So thank you for all the trailblazers in this room for paving the way for women like myself.